Okay, I'd like to call the meeting to order. This is the state's 911 advisory board meeting. Um, Chief Silsby. Here for Chief Silsby, Michelle Bland. Chief Langston. Here. Chief Spiegel. Here. Sheriff Bonner. Chris Heron here for Sheriff Bonner. Sheriff Maley. Absent. The Chief Trower Nick, and he won't be here today. Um, Leslie Wilson. Here. Chip Yarborough. Absent. Charles Cullen. Here. And Charles Perdan. Okay, with everyone here, we do have a quorum. Um, the first order of business is to approve the September 2013 minutes. Motion to approve. Second. Any comments, discussion? Minutes are approved as written. So we're going to move on to our first, our presentation for today, which is our first net board member, Jeff Johnson. Jeff Johnson has an extensive public safety background with the broad experience at both the local and national level. Chief Johnson served as chair of Oregon's statewide interoperability executive council, which is transitioning from four independent state-owned radio networks into a single interoperable modern voice and data network. Prior to that, Chief Johnson was at the, okay, what was your fire department? Thank you. <laughs> CEO for 15 years, Chief Johnson is very active nationally as on public safety um, communication matters and has served on the International Association of Fire Chiefs Board of Directors and served as president and chairman of the board. He is now CEO of Western Fire Chiefs Association and, ser and served as represent represent representative of SAFECOM Emergency Response Council. He also serves as chairman of Emergency Service Consulting International, a company majority owned by IAFC to provide emergency services counseling. In addition, Jeff is the board, one of the board members for FirstNet, and he will be presenting to us what FirstNet is, where we're at, and the nexus with um, 911. So welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Madam Chair. And is that speaker working, or do we want to have you up? here at the dais with the speaker. Well, yeah, that one's not. Okay, yeah, that. because we have folks watching. Um, so what, what you desire? Up here. On the corner. That way everyone will be able to hear you. So um, yes. <laughs> he will not mind. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I had dinner with Chief Trowernick last evening. And when you're in his area, he, you know, when you fly through this area, he gets a report and he calls you. Uh, he had an injury to his eye and uh, isn't here to, uh, isn't able to be here today. Uh, members of the board, Madam Chair, and, um, and the audience, I'd like to thank you for your, the time today to talk about FirstNet. Um, as, as the chair mentioned, I am one of the board members, one of the 12 board members. Uh, that are not uh, federal cabinet members. And um, I'm here today to kind of brief you on it. I, I want to make sure that you're aware there'll be plenty of time for questions. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them. Um, I think about um, the majority of what I'll tell you today is uh, pretty sound. And I will use uh, terms like I think or I anticipate if it's gray. Uh, I'll use more definitive language if it's uh, a certainty. Um, anytime you're standing up a new entity, and this is unprecedented, there has not, to our knowledge, anywhere in the world been a nationwide public safety broadband network built for public safety anywhere in the world. So this is a first, and this is a new independent authority. Uh, so it is independent, but it is within the federal government, and there's aspects of that that are unknown and untested. So given that, uh, there are things we don't do, know, and there are things that are subject to change. So, you know, that's just uh, where we find ourselves today. Uh, let me give you the 30,000-foot overview. Uh, Congress has appropriated 
uh, $7 billion in two slices, $2 billion up front, $5 billion with Spectrum auctions. They've also given uh, FirstNet uh, access to 20 megahertz of Spectrum. Uh, this is in the 700 Spectrum uh, band. It is uh, 20 megahertz of contiguous Spectrum. Uh, that, coupled with the money, coupled with the third element, is what would fund and operate FirstNet. The third element is Congress authorized FirstNet to be able to enterprise the spectrum. That means when we're not driving on the spectrum freeway, that we can resell it or enterprise it or leverage it in a fashion that puts money into the network for construction, maintenance, ongoing operation of the network. Um, so those three things, uh, we believe, are going to provide uh, adequate funding for deployment, which after the August adoption of the uh, work plan has a rollout of the initial phases of the network uh, about two years and nine months from today. Um, where we are today, the board was seated a little over a year ago. They were seated in uh, August of 2012. Um, we have conducted and completed consultation with 55 states, territories, and commonwealths. Uh, California participated. We held the, uh, this region in, at our meeting in San Francisco. Uh, we continue to have ongoing dialogue with individual states that are prepared to discuss with us uh, what their needs are. Um, this whole uh, preliminary session of consultation all precedes what will be known as the official state consultation process. This, the law calls for FirstNet to engage each state and their SPOC, the single point of contact, and it requires FirstNet to develop a proposal for each state that's unique to the state. The law requires that FirstNet uh, work with the state to come up with what the proposal is. Um, that will outline the relationship between FirstNet what its offerings are, and how we'll do business in the state. And, uh, and, and that interactive process will result in a proposal. <clears throat> now, if you can imagine for a minute, FirstNet will work with California specifically in this case. We'll develop what our offering in California is going to be through that process. The state's SPOC, single point of contact, uh, will articulate uh, the state's needs and operational requirements to FirstNet for inclusion in this document. It will be the SPOC's responsibility uh, to include, to the degree they see necessary, local government, cities, counties, tribes, uh, and all the stakeholders necessary so that they've adequately heard what you need at the local level. That gets poured into this document. But once this document is finished, uh, and I'm going to anticipate that that's probably within uh, 12 months to 14 months from now. This document will be placed on the desk of the governor. The minute that document hits the, the desk, the governor has 90 days within which to take one of three actions. The first action is to look through it and say, we agree. Well, let's do it. So you're in. Uh, the second option that the governor can do is the governor can just say nothing. And uh, according to the law, saying nothing means we're in. We like it. Nice work. So we're in means we're in, and saying nothing means we're in. And that, but you do have a third option, and that's what's known as opt-out. And opt-out means you're in. Opt-out means you're in, but you're going to build it. You have to go back to the fundamental purpose for FirstNet. It was the last standing recommendation of the 9-11 Commission trying to resolve the communication problems that came out in 9-11, and in part, Congress said, um, we are looking for a single network nationwide. Today, there's over 20,000 independently owned, managed, and operated land mobile radio networks on six different slices of spectrum in digital and analog in hopefully all narrowband by now uh, with different proprietary softwares by the manufacturers, over 20,000 separate networks. Congress have spent billions of dollars on interoperability. They did not want to repeat that mistake with FirstNet. So they said one network nationwide, 20 megahertz of spectrum, here's the money to build it, enterprise the spectrum, but we want one. 
So Congress wasn't interested in five states are in and the next five aren't and the next two are and the next one isn't. They wanted a nationwide network. So there's two ways to be in and a third way to build it yourself, which means opt out. But you have to build it to FirstNet's technical standards and you have to connect to the FirstNet core, which means you're in. So those are really the three options. If the governor were to decide you're out, you're in, you're out. If you were to do that, you have 180 days to provide a very detailed plan to FirstNet of how you intend to build a FirstNet grade network here in the state of California uh, that will be part of the network. So uh, that's kind of an overview of uh, what the process would be. Uh, today, uh, we have hired uh, the core of our executive team. Uh, they are in the process now of hiring the staff uh, uh, that will do uh, the lion's share of the outreach. We have got a largely uh, contracted technical staff uh, that's doing most of the engineering, and that uh, engineering operation is based here in California, uh, in the Bay Area. And I think overall, I think what you see, the $194 million that the board approved in August, um, you know, that's going to go toward uh, kind of frame up what and who our network partners could be uh, to frame up design uh, and, and vet uh, philosophies associated with the network core, which is mandated, uh, as I mentioned, uh, to start a state outreach. Um, we are negotiating today spectrum leases for the broadband opportunity grant uh, entities. Um, this is an important component. Uh, California has two BTOP entities. Uh, you have Bay Ricks and LA Ricks. Uh, LA Ricks, the negotiations are complete and they possess a spectrum lease for FirstNet. Um, and then Bay Ricks is still in negotiations with FirstNet. And I will tell you very succinctly, the FirstNet's interest in the BTOP projects is this easy. We want to make sure that the money that has been spent and any money that is spent in the future, that it's building toward what FirstNet will be. <clears throat> if, if you don't do that, then we've failed the core mission that Congress laid out for us, and that's a single nationwide network. So BTOP negotiations uh, continue, two down, six to go, and whether those six uh, receive spectrum leases is all dependent on whether they can demonstrate that their network will uh, be part of the first net network when it's all built out and done. There will be a mobile hotspot component, there will be a satellite component to first net, um, <clears throat> and then we will figure out ways to leverage in existing infrastructure. So now does that mean commercial infrastructure? So does that mean cell phone companies? Uh, yeah, it could. It very likely could. Uh, could it mean that we're interested in leveraging your infrastructure, your towers, or your backhaul, or some component of systems that you own and operate? Yes, it very well could mean that. Um, what we know is that based on preliminary reviews, it takes approximately uh, 41,000 towers to build a first net network plus the satellite layer. Um, of 41,000 towers, there's two ways to get those towers. You can go build those yourself. Um, and I think there's plenty of people watching and in this room today that know how much a tower costs to build and the regulatory process that you need to go through. That A, is more money than we have, and B, is longer than we want to take. Uh, plus, there's over a half million towers in America that would meet our needs. Now, I'm not saying they're precisely like we want them today, but if they're in the right spot uh, for FirstNet and they lack something, then we'll use our money to replace what they lack. But is our goal to hang FirstNet RF equipment on those towers? Um, if the towers or the buildings are in any way not up to our standards, then we'll use our money to make them that way. And uh, I anticipate that we will either buy or lease or trade uh, for access to those towers. But at the end of the day, FirstNet will have, need to have somewhere in the neighborhood of 41,000 towers uh, deployed nationwide that are mission critical. And mission critical means, of course, uh, amongst other things, that when the power goes down, the towers are still up. When the earth shakes and the wind blows, the towers are still up. The 
that the back hall is looped in a fashion that if one leg is cut by a backhoe induced failure, that the network doesn't go down and that you have provisions for every aspect of network operation that make it mission critical. So let's talk just briefly about what FirstNet is and what it isn't. Uh, what FirstNet is not is it is not a replacement for land mobile radio communications today. It's not. Um, the standards don't exist in 3GPP uh, for uh, off-network performance and one-to-many communication and a lot of the functionality that we expect out of LMR communications. Uh, there is not voice over LTE uh, to the degree that we need it to be operable to deploy early on. So it is not a situation where FirstNet is uh, designed or intended when first deployed to replace your land mobile radio networks. It's not. But there will be a point at some time in the future where voice over LTE that is mission critical in terms of its functionality, that's a reality. I don't know when that is. I don't know if that's seven years, five years, 10 or 15 years. We don't know. We know it's a very likely inevitability, but there's no utility in trying to estimate when that comes to, comes to the stage. It just, uh, today, it will be deployed as mission critical data with uh, non-mission critical voice to start with. And, and why non-mission critical voice? Well, it's our goal that this would be a replacement cost, not a new cost. So, so many police officers and firefighters they have uh, cell phones that they're using in the field. If FirstNet uh, deployed a device that had cell phone quality voice, but it was mission critical data, then we could literally put you in a position where you replace a cell phone with a far more able device that is cell phone capable, it's on a mission critical network, it's a network that's dedicated to public safety, and it does high-speed data, and it has the full uh, public safety core access and full public safety uh, app store access. So that's what FirstNet is and what it isn't. We anticipate that we will make devices in everything from uh, cards for your computers and your mobile data computers to uh, handheld devices. The form factor will look something like a cell phone to uh, dongles or any other thing that would enable devices that you're using today. Um, I think this would probably be a good time for me to stop and take any questions and then proceed from there if, if necessary. No questions? Uh, well, I, want, I want to be clear. The, uh, the discussion of moving uh, the probability of moving to a voice system in the future, uh, that funding is not in place yet, correct? Um, if, uh, when we're talking about replacing land mobile radio, um, it wouldn't be a cost item. It's really a standards issue, um, that, that there's no standards for manufacturing that kind of performance and functionality. So it isn't something that would require an entire rethink of the network. It's an application that would ride on a data network, but there is a there is a price to that, is there not? Um, I'm not I, asking I, you to I, quantify yeah, I, the I price. I don't know. But I, I I can't see that it would be uh, dramatically different than the device we're deploying. If if you can talk on the device you're deploying today, and all we're talking about is how functional that was, I don't see that that adds a. Um, I can't see that it adds cost to it. And, uh, and it's anticipated then that the, uh, the system would, be, would use the existing radio systems? No, it would not. Locally? No. So, so there would be cost at the local level to replace the, the devices that are used for that communication? <clears throat> it's an excellent question. Uh, so, so let me touch on that briefly. So what will it cost? So first, there is no requirement at all that uh, FirstNet, that you use FirstNet services. So while the law comes with the requirement to build a nationwide network, there is no requirement in the law that makes you buy it. So how do you, how do, you do that? You know, so, 
So what's the point of having the state opt in or opt out? And the whole point is, is that each state has to be covered with FirstNet so that there's a single nationwide ubiquitous network. That's the point. And uh, the law requires FirstNet to develop in a fashion that is self-sustaining from a business perspective. So our goal would be to charge prices that are less than what you're currently charging and providing a more robust network dedicated to public safety. If you do that, then we believe you will make that choice. So the burden's on FirstNet to provide a service offering that is attractive or you won't choose it. And the same would be true with voice as it is data. So, um, you know, our goal is to come to market as close to zero as we can get, and, uh, and certainly less than what you're paying today, and put you on a mission critical network instead of a commercial network. I think, I think the model's laudable, but I, from a planning standpoint, I think for, for the chief executives across the board in public safety, they need to start ramping up for the eventuality that, uh, as an analogy, that by the time this comes in place, your iPhone 5 is not going to be compatible with it. You'll still be buying phones or devices, so you're exchanging that cost. But if you don't have a transition and it's a, okay, we're cutting over to this system, there's going to be a significant capital outlay that needs to be planned for while the ongoing expenses, is, as you've explained, will be a trade-off for what they're already paying for existing services, whether that be participating in a countywide uh, LMR system, uh, plus their cellular systems, plus their data systems, all of that combined should be, as you've explained, uh, at a more competitive price. It's just that uh, capital outlay is going to have to be planned for. It's an excellent. It's an excellent point. I think there will uh, we will hit a point once we've chosen a network model. We you will see when the products are going to hit the market and be able to plan for it with enough horizon that you can adopt it. So so let's talk a little bit about how that happens. <clears throat> well, first you have to listen to the states before you know what they need. Um, listening will take place within this next uh, one-year window or so. So you've got to listen. You get the requirements that are poured into the network. Then you choose a network. Once you choose a network, then that will tell you, once we make a network choice, that'll tell you how long do we deploy it, who and what are likely to be our network partners and partner opportunities, what and when, or what is the price likely to be, and when is it likely to be deployed per region. And I think uh, there should be adequate planning horizon once we've chosen a network model. Thank you. It's an excellent, excellent point. Well, and I have just one comment on that. The state as a whole does not have to start buying all the devices at the same time, correct? Mm -hmm. I mean, different right. cities, counties can kind of jump onto the network as they're able to. That's correct. We, uh, there's no requirement that anybody, state, city, or local, buy the devices or the services. So it's got to be a compelling case. And then you buy it, and you buy it on your own timeline. So, you know, it's going to behoove FirstNet if we have many early adopters early. Um, so it's going to behoove us, uh, as was suggested, right, that we are putting out a timeline uh, that people can plan for uh, in terms of their adoption. Uh, one of the questions we receive a lot is, uh, you know, what will be the likely impact on local systems, local infrastructure? So <clears throat> I want to, uh, you know, do a little myth busting here. Um, FirstNet has no provision or authority uh, under the law to take your assets. So if you have towers, uh, we can't take them. Um, we don't have any desire to take them. If you have buildings or any other infrastructure, we're not going to take that either. Now, if you have towers and, uh, and they're in a place we need them, then we can talk to you about that. And we may reach business terms that makes you say, yeah, I'd like you to have them. And we say, yeah, we would like to have them. And we reach terms. But that can only happen if we mutually agree that our interests and your interests are aligned. Um, that are the, those are the only circumstances under which uh, your assets can be become part of the FirstNet network. 
Second question I face a lot, especially in the APCO and NINA community, is what does this mean for 911 centers and dispatchers? Well, you're always going to need 911 centers and dispatchers. Uh, none of this uh, changes it, but I think uh, every center will need to be connected to FirstNet, just like you need to be connected to the various communication systems that you are today. Um, it will be a primary means of wirelessly communicating with your field resources, and those are going to be need to be connected. Um, any databases that any unit of local government have or manage, those, those databases will be permissioned by the owner of the data. If that's Department of Transportation or Department of Corrections or Parole Services or whoever it is, that's their database. Connecting it to the network would mean that they would be permissioned and ruled by the people that own the data. We are simply a digital freeway for transporting that kind of information. I do think, though, if you look around the world, uh, and I'm speaking specifically to dispatchers and how dispatch centers are operated, and more specifically in the police environment than the fire environment, is uh, I, I do think that technology will cause an evolution of how dispatchers spend their day. And uh, by that, I mean, and this is regardless of FirstNet, this is just what's happening technologically around the world. The more that a police officer, let me just pick police officer for a moment, the more that police officers' work can be done in machine-to-machine -machine communication without requiring the intervention of a human to run a license plate, for example. If a license plate reading camera on a patrol car runs the plate automatically, then that doesn't require me to call it in and read it to a person who types it into a machine, retrieves it, and repeats it. Machine-to-machine -machine communication, uh, regardless of FirstNet, machine-to-machine -machine communication will change various aspects of how we do our job in a dispatch center. Uh, Next-Gen 911 will change how we do our job in dispatch centers. As they, we coalesce around FirstNet and a single technological platform, I think you'll see unified approaches for things like how alarms come in, uh, how Central Station Alarm Association and their affiliates, how they access our centers. I think it's likely to become more uniform. Uh, I think it'll be more uniform how OnStar and the other businesses like OnStar flow data and information into our centers. And I think that as, uh, as information becomes more direct, uh, and more accessible to the field and it becomes more mobile, um, we're very likely to see a dispatcher's role transition to be an earlier part of the investigation. Uh, people that are able to draw what's known as non-obvious associations um, because they're able to see a vast collection of databases and data sets, they actually are likely to take on a larger uh, role in terms of thinking through the event and thinking through the crime. Um, and, and not, as in some places, just be the broker of information, but to literally be uh, the initial phases of the investigation uh, because of their access to, f so, to so many databases. And we're seeing this in some of the more advanced uh, systems in this country uh, where the dispatch function is still a dispatch function, call taking is still call taking, but there's this new added layer, and that's in how you deal with non-obvious associations. I would take any more questions that you may have. I had a question. <clears throat> Chief, what's the, uh, the agreement or relationship you said FirstNet has already with L.A. Ricks? Um, L.A. Ricks was one of the eight BTOP areas, uh, broadband opportunity uh, areas, and that was coming out of the area when the uh, era when the federal government saw that the best way to build a network was to do uh, 56 separate state, territory, and commonwealth systems and or uh, large metropolitan areas, uh, large, large statistical areas, they could be built out in the same fashion. So the federal government at the time uh, let leases for 10 megahertz of spectrum. Then people applied for money under the broadband opportunity grant, and they received it, and they'd build to a common standard. When, when Oregon got built, and California got built, and regions got built to the same technical standard, you would plug them into one another, and that way we would stitch a network together nationwide. Well, that whole vision died 
with the congressional vision that said we're going to do one network and we're going to do it one way. Um, because LA was early in the BTOP process, their plans were approved, they had a spectrum lease, and they actually received money, signed contracts, and started to do things. Um, so FirstNet wants to make sure that that money is spent in a fashion that fits FirstNet. Um, LA was able to prove up uh, that, that they had a plan that was consistent with where FirstNet was going, and FirstNet uh, uh, went into an agreement with them that leased our spectrum to LA RICS. The 20 megahertz of spectrum is at their disposal. And uh, then also that started the process to, un, uh, to uh, essentially unloose the money uh, that had been tied up while we figured this out. And then they're likely to be a, a longtime partner for FirstNet as you work from where they are till they just become a full-on partner for FirstNet. Thank you. Chief, can you uh, speak to the negotiations with Bay Ricks? Some spectrum side, I understand some of that's probably confidential, and uh, but is the concern to make sure that they are building out to the standard or to the larger network specifications that you're looking at? It's an excellent question, sir. Um, so, the, you know, my rule of thumb is right. I'll tell you everything, unless I tell you I'm not telling you everything, and that's the case here. I'm not going to tell you everything. It is subject to negotiations, and and we're not uh, at liberty to comment on it. But I can talk about the stuff that's in the public record. And, and that is is that Bayrix, uh, the primary contractor there is Motorola. And so the negotiations are with Bayrix and Motorola. And uh, FirstNet, it, it all revolves around, FirstNet's interest revolves around making sure that it's part of the network the way FirstNet intends to build it. And I, I think that's always been uh, really kind of the difficulty is to try to work, I think it's Barry Frazier up there, try to work with Barry Frazier and his team to try to figure out if we can make that assurance. Likewise, you know, uh, Bay Rick's partner, Motorola, has, you know, their interest and their issues to make sure that it's a business relationship that's good with them. So it's a little more complicated than it was necessarily with L.A. Rick's, but that's essentially it. There's one added element uh, that we're looking for in BTOP uh, authorization, and that's that we're looking for each area uh, to teach us a lesson. So we're, we're considering them early adopters, as it were. Uh, when you're going to build out a network like, network like this, to have people that can beat you to the punch, um, then they can learn lessons and save the bigger system from making some of the same mistakes. So we're looking for each one to contribute something unique and something special. Uh, one of the reasons we like the Bay Ricks project is because of the app development community in the Bay Area. Um, as you know, FirstNet is going to have an app store dedicated just to public safety. So uh, we were excited and continue to be excited about the opportunity to engage the Bay Area because of the potential that they bring uh, for a really strong app community and engaging a strong app community. Uh, New Mexico is the second area that's received uh, a spectrum lease. Um, we needed something different from New Mexico. I think it's fair to say the app development community in New Mexico is different than the app community in uh, the Bay Area. But what New Mexico has is they have border interference problems. Uh, there are drug cartels running in our spectrum, uh, running land mobile radio trunked networks uh, just across the border in Mexico. And we needed to get that process started with the State Department and, our, and the other federal partners and, frankly, our partners in Mexico on how we're going to resolve interference issues. So New Mexico was a logical partner for that lesson. And then so we're looking to each one to teach us a new lesson, and that's what we know today. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the board? <sighs> Well, I did just one, one point of clarification is a lot of this is still under development, correct? So we really don't know what the devices are going to look like ultimately correct. Uh, once this network is built out. So to uh, Chief Spiegel's point, if you're looking ahead to what you should be planning for, uh, it may be you can use your existing MDC and just have to buy a dongle that allow you to connect to the network. You may need a completely new handheld device if you're going to be using a mobile app. But a lot of that will all be fleshed out as the, as the network is built out and the, and the standards and specifications are defined, correct? I think that's well said, uh, sir. I think the bottom line is if you were FirstNet 
you would want as broad of adoption as you could possibly get. I mean, let's face it, that Timothy McVeigh, uh, after the Oklahoma City bombing, could have been driving through the smallest, poorest sheriff's department in the country. And we will all be advantaged uh, as public safety officials if everyone is on the same network and that we can do business together and that data is shared broadly and images are shared uh, ubiquitously and without barrier. So it's in our interest, it's in public safety's interest if we have broad adoption and that means to the point. Um, we want to make sure that existing equipment is easily uh, essentially converted so that it operates on FirstNet. The devices have to be rugged. Uh, they have to be cop and firefighter friendly. Uh, they have got to be everything that you would want at street level. Um, they've got to be intrinsically safe. They have to be waterproof. There's a lot of aspects of it. If you, if you fail on those, I mean, the true test at the end of the day is you can build it technically correct. You can build functionality to the highest level, but it, if if at the street level, the, poli the police officer or the fire lieutenant, if they don't grab that device first when they need to do business, then we've failed to do our job. It has to be street proven and street embraced or, or we will have failed our mission. So we've got to hit all those targets and we've got to allow the chiefs a horizon in which they can plan. I think uh, just one more thing, Chief. Uh, I, I know on behalf of the California police chiefs, um, we prepared uh, responses that were sent through through Karen, and I don't want to uh, I don't want to diminish at all the um, the importance of us keeping the dispatch community included in the dialogue. While on its on its face, uh, the appearance of new technology can often sound like it's going to eliminate uh, something that a dispatcher has done in the past. But there are other things that, uh, that come into play, and, and I would use your example, for instance, that a police officer in the field who can get a direct hit on a stolen vehicle, there is still a dispatch function to That's ensure right. that there's adequate backup, the closest units are responding, right. and those types of things. And, and to that end, uh, you know, just for the, for the record, I, I want to ensure that at our state level that we're including uh, the practitioners in the discussions of how the new technology is going to uh, create one advantage in one area and make sure that it doesn't have a domino effect that goes the other way in another area. Yeah, I, I think that's well said, and I think that's our point. I, I think regardless of FirstNet, technology changes all of our lives, and, uh, and it will change dispatchers' lives, cops, firefighters, and paramedics' lives. I, I think the... The point is, it doesn't mean the elimination of any of those functions. It means it will change them. And we have to stay plugged in and involved to make sure that we're maximizing its effectiveness at the street level. But I, like you, I, I have been to centers where the functionality is very in line with what we're talking about. And it's a building full of dispatchers. They're, they still dispatch. They still take calls. But it's a very different uh, a, a, it's a really different kind of job in some ways. Some parts are the same. Thank you. And then at the state level, just for clarification, we do have our California First Responder Network Board of Directors set up, and they will begin their meetings in January. So we'll, we'll be planning those meetings, and we will keep the 911 Advisory Board um, up to date with what we're doing, and hopefully you will also participate in the meetings as well. I'd like to thank you, Madam Chair, for the invitation today uh, to speak with your group. Um, I am West Coast based. I'm out of Bend, Oregon. Um, first Net board members were chosen by discipline. There's a sheriff, a police chief, uh, a firefighter, and a paramedic on the board. Um, and we were also chosen not only by discipline, but regionally uh, dispersed. So I'm right up the street, as it were. California is an important market for us. It's an important partner for us. And, um, and, and we stay uh, very in touch with Karen and her associates. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out me, to me directly. And, um, and we'll make sure that you get the answers you need. So thank you for the invitation. And I apologize, Karen, that I will excuse myself after my presentation. But thank you very much for all the assistance you've provided and the opportunities to discuss it.
Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time today. Um, and I hope the board members were pleased. Um, we've been really wanting to get more information about FirstNet. And you've actually shed a lot of light on it. I think everybody, just by the, the number of questions, seems to have a better understanding at this point. Good. So thank you very much. Thank you. The next item on the board on the agenda is unfinished business. Um, so, the draft California 911 approved training document, Bill Anderson. I was going to ask if we can both walk through uh, that way. We'll both presentations in one shot. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Of course, um, the wireless routing accuracy. <clears throat> that says the state 911 advisory board. Okay. I can give some update on that. Um, I will be going to Washington, D.C. to participate with the FCC on Monday in a work group. Um, and I believe others from California will be going as well. So at the next meeting, we will have more information. That workshop will be on a webinar, is what I've been told. So if anybody would like to also um, view it, it, it'll be out there for everyone to see. I guess the, the concern is is just keeping this on here till we come to some resolution or have maybe some answers or um, finding out what technology is available out there to have a better delivery. And I'm hoping to get more information through the FCC workshop, which is why they're doing this. Um, I know I did speak with Arizona, and they're, as far as they're concerned, they get all their phase two 911 calls delivered the first time without rebid. So I don't know what makes them a little bit different than what we're doing. So I think there's a lot of questions um, that we'll be able to interact with with the FCC and get more information. Well, well, I think in some articles, I mean, they pointed out if Google, Facebook, and all these applicants, they can get phase two immediately, we should be able to get phase two immediately without rebidding. My question to them was when I'm in San Francisco, which is a very condensed area with a lot of so cell phones. Like there. The technology is there, it's just why yes. is it being applied in the 911 delivery? Yes, because I can always get my location and I can always get directions immediately. Well, Siri knows where I am. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, so we, we will find able as dispatchers mm -hmm. to know where everybody is immediately. Yeah, so we will find out more through the FCC and find out where some of the gaps are. Um, I'm also concerned with the gaps on our equipment um, on how the equipment is actually capturing the data, which also I'm hoping to have some good dialogue when we go to the FCC. Thank you. I think that's a good point. If we all had, uh, if our GPS was 30 seconds behind, many of us wouldn't make this meeting. So uh, <laughs> it, it, the technology is there. It's just how do we adapt it to our environment, right? I just needed to turn my GPS on. <laughs> Were there any other questions or comments? Okay, for the Draft 911 approved training document, Bill Anderson. Good morning. Uh, in the July meeting, can everybody hear me okay? In July meeting, uh, Member Berdan asked us to put together a uh, draft document on um, the annual training allotment guidelines for submitting our request. And so we have done that. Uh, keep in mind this is in draft form currently at this time. And it's really designed to try and make it as easy as possible on the PSAPs to request uh, training and also at the same time capture repetitive training that we feel is a benefit to, for the piece out so you don't have to uh, reapply for it every year, but it is pre-approved. So we'll go ahead and go through the document and Paul, I guess, first slide, first slide please. Okay, so each year PSAPs and 911 county coordinators may be reimbursed up to $3,000 uh, per state fiscal year. Uh, everybody's aware of that now. That's pretty much been uh, uh, presented to everyone. Um, and it's specifically defined for 911 related training that's held within the state of California within the fiscal year. 
the annual tra training allotment uh, will be used toward reimbursement of travel expenses for pre-approved 911 related training and any unspent uh, training allotment balance is not applied to the following fiscal year. So it's all within the current fiscal year that you're operating in. Um, we'll issue advance notification of any pre-approved 911 related training courses and our office will definitely make sure that you have defined expenses eligible for reimbursement. I know we publish some forms right now that make that simple for you and define how to go ahead and ask for reimbursements. Um, if it's not published, uh, then of course approval will be required and I believe the forms are all out there for you to uh, make a request for pre-approval of training. Uh, this one here really is just on who to contact. Right now it's Victoria Solis. Uh, the information you need to put in the training, of course, your training dates, start and end times, method of training, whether it's webinar, classroom, uh, cost per person total, and a description of the training. Uh, this is what we start to use to take a look at if there's repetitive training courses that people are asking for. These are the ones we can take a look at and see if we should pre-approve those on a yearly basis so we don't have to constantly ask for them. Paul? Uh, and again, uh, we didn't want to do a, just start building a list because we really weren't sure what all the various training courses are out there. So as they do become uh, presented to us and we can start taking a look at them, adding those to the list. But so we. We went for some general examples of the type of training we're really expecting to see for requests from the uh, annual training allotment. Of course, it's 911 call taker, telephone techniques, processing, uh, handling 911 calls, uh, uh, training in public safety technologies, next generation 911, text to 911, and of course, uh, EMP certification courses. Paul? And uh, right now, the two methods we're looking at are classroom and webinar. If other methods present themselves that we feel are viable, we'll go ahead and add those to the list. And training reimbursement, uh, proof of completion of training is required. Uh, certification of completion of training, uh, print out a message of the webinar conclusion, documentation of course completing are all acceptable methods. And as far as tracking of the approved training, uh, an annual training allotment approved training list will be maintained on our website, and that will be built up as we go along. Uh, currently, we have two or three different uh, uh, classes already uh, approved and posted. Uh, we'll yeah, update it each time a new course becomes uh, pre-approved. And these currently are the pre-approved training courses uh, that we expect to approve yearly. Uh, so as new ones do come up, we'll go ahead and add those onto the list. And that's it on an annual training allotment uh, guidelines. Any questions on that? We try to keep it simple so it's not too difficult for you or for us for that matter. Bill, I'm assuming that, the, for example, the, the national conferences would only be reimbursed if they are taking place inside the state of California, That's is that correct. correct? That's correct, yes. Thank you for that clarification, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's all of California courses. Do we have any other questions? We're hoping by next year, after we go through a year of training, that the list will be much longer of the pre-approved and it will, clarity will happen through time as far as with the, the Karen, classes Karen, if, if I can, mm -hmm. um, I know that the intent was to keep the list simple, uh, but the appearance is, is that the conference is what's reimbursable as opposed to the training. And I think that there are a lot of, uh, a lot of conferences taught up and down the state. Uh, I know from the law enforcement side, you've got everything from Cal Chiefs, state sheriffs, <laughs> CPOA. And uh, in the past, certainly when we've looked at post-training within those courses, it's the courses that are offered at the conference that are specific to the training credit. And so to the end that um, as, as you continue to flesh this out uh, to ensure that there's a value of, of training, I think there should be a number of courses at the conference minimally that are attended and certified uh, for the state to be picking up the bill for somebody to attend a conference. Okay, and what we do with the conferences, we do look at the conference outline, which we did for both APCO and um, 
Cal Nina has actually renamed their conference to an annual training mission. So it is focused more now on training than conference speak type of thing. So we are, we're really focusing to make sure that these conferences provide the training and it's not just a conference environment. I understand. I'm, I'm with you there and, 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 I, and I understand that that's the direction that most of the associations have gone uh, the same way. I'm, I'm saying the attendee participates in the training blocks that are provided at the conference and that a number of those are determined. It's one thing to go to a conference and enjoy the conference and the venue of that conference pick up one training class and say, well, gee, I've met the obligations and here's three grand from the state uh, in reimbursement, as opposed to suggesting that if the conference is a three-day conference, that there's at least one training course a day that is attended, certified, and submitted as, as part of that, um, I, I you know, think for we, the reimbursement. Well, and I think that's what we were trying to capture in the reimbursement guidelines um, in the back. Now I can't find it in the front. Um, where we wanted to have, okay, this is making me crazy. I saw the certi I, I saw that it that it's a certification, but I'm still back yes. to uh, some sort of recommendations, whether that comes from the advisory uh, committee here or or staff or combination thereof, or even from the training providers. You know what the number of training courses at the conference I see what you're going. would fulfill the intent of why we're sending somebody to the conference. Um, we did you want to come? We'll be glad to take a look at that and make sure that we meet that because I agree with that. We want the training to happen at the conference as well. Um, so we'll have to go back and see how we can look at how many training should be required, and we'll work with both the associations on that as yeah. well. Since, since this is a draft document, we were going to ask if the advisory committee would assign this to the LRPC to review and take a look at and make suggestions uh, to what could improve the document a little bit better. RPC. And, and as, as Chief Spiegel uh, pointed out, that that is something we could take a look at. How, how do we account for uh, members attending conferences and we can capture their time at the training courses? And, and I think some of the national conferences, they actually scan your ID when you go to these courses and give you a printout at the end. But is that something that the state office wants to have to take on, verifying that everybody has gone to three classes when they attend a conference? I'm not sure that's something you have the, that you really want to uh, have as part of your uh, uh, tasks. But some minimal amount, actually, the, you know, the, the emphasis of the event should be training. And I, and I think we all agree with that. And if there's a minimum number of classes that should be offered, that's certainly something we could discuss at uh, the LRPC. Yeah, as, Karen <laughs> Paul. as Karen pointed out, we, we do try and do diligence in looking at the agenda uh, and, and curriculum that the conference is offering. And there's a certain expectation that people, when you do go to these, they are going to benefit from the presentations. Uh, the technology that is, is going to be available to them so they can understand what is going on. Uh, but you know, if it's something we can take a look at also at verifying that they are going to the conferences to, uh, you know, for that reimbursement, it's just definitely entertain that. And it looked like the LRPC would be willing to take this on. And I know we seem to have given you quite a bit to do with the LRPC. So, um, but I'd like to do Bill, let's make sure that we have a staff person there to be able to help on this particular project. Uh, I sit on the LRPC at, at the meetings. There you go. Oh, okay. The office so, um, has been very supportive. Uh, okay, I just want to make, because this is, again, a little bit more of a workload than... Sure. I, my comment would be, I think if we take that on, and we do have APCO and Nina representatives that sit on the LRPC, um, so we'll do a little business here in advance. I think if uh, those folks could come prepared to let us know whether that is something that, you know, Cal Nina and, and uh, APCO could take on. Uh, Charlie, as you mentioned, at the national conference, you know, they're able to scan things and not to say that you need to have that, but can you can certificates be provided that could be submitted back to the state? I think that would be something for us to look into, see how easy that could be accomplished. Yeah, and there's really very few conferences we're looking at. It's really APCO and Cal Nina. Uh, anything else that is a meeting, if the agenda doesn't show a, a, a good portion of it dedicated to uh, dispatcher training or call taker training or public safety training in general, those would not be pre-approved. So it really has to have a, a I, I think good to the Chief's point, though, 
what we all probably can support is to make sure that those that, that are attending who are getting reimbursed are going to some minimum number of the classes being Correct. offered. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's a good point. Yeah, that's the, I understand that. Thank you, LRPC. Were there any other questions, comments? Can we take a comment from the audience? I think we did have some. Input? Um, actually, we should take that as part of the agenda under public comment to follow the agenda process. Okay. Okay, if there's no more comments or questions, we're going to move now to reports. Um, the 911 branch report, Bill Anderson. Thank you. Okay, uh, to start off with, you have three handouts. Uh, in your packet. The first one uh, is the wireless 911 deployment status. Um, as of September 30th, 2013, we still have 11 PSAPs uh, not taking their wireless calls. And as always, we always ask you to go ahead and work with your constituents to try and uh, get them to take their wireless calls. Uh, but it is every, it seems like every time we do this, an extra one does take their wireless calls, so we're getting down there. Uh, it's just taking a little while. Uh, the second handout is titled State 911 Advisory Board Active Tasks. Uh, if you would please review that and make sure that is up to date. If there is anything missing or needs to be adjusted, please call out, contact Paul DeMay from the 911 office and he can make those corrections. The third document is the Setna Fund Condition Statement. Uh, that is the same fund condition statement that you've probably seen two or three times now as the one posted. Uh, the new fund condition statement will not be available until January 2014, and we will go ahead and provide that once we receive that. In regards to current projects and initiatives that the 911 branch is working on, uh, obviously the Setna Fund is one that's of interest to quite a few people right now. Uh, in reviewing the fund condition statement, if you've had an opportunity to really look at that, you'll notice over the three fiscal years presented, the uh, annual revenue from the Setna Fund has decreased. Uh, and according to the Board of Equalization, that has been decreasing continuously at a rate of about 4.74% for the past four or five years. Uh, naturally, that uh, requires some action. Uh, the uh, 911 office did make recommendation uh, in September to the Board of Equalization to increase the Setna Fund surcharge rate from it was current level of one half of 1% to the maximum of uh, three quarters of 1%. That was heard by the Board of Equalization on their October 13th meeting in Culver City. Uh, and looking at the video from that uh, meeting, uh, there was no opposition to the surcharge increase. There were questions, but there was only one question and that was answered quite quickly. So we fully expect that surcharge to go into effect. The Board of Equalization should publish that shortly because they do have to notify the carriers by uh, mid-December so they can make adjustments to the rates. Um, one other thing the 911 office is doing internally, we are doing a, a thorough audit of the Setna Fund for the past few years. Uh, staff is going back and we're doing a line item audit of all expenses that the uh, office pays for. Uh, looking at income we've been receiving over the past few years so we can really see what the issue is with the fund. We know it's decreasing. Uh, the increase in the surcharge I would look at right now is a short-term fix because the problem with the surcharge and the problem way it's collected is attached to a funding mechanism that seems to be decreasing rapidly and we don't see a change. It may balance out or level out at some point in time but we need to see if there's any trends in certain areas that we can look at and make adjustments to now. We're also making and looking at uh, areas within the Setna that we can uh, 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 make changes to right now. The fact that we uh, stopped the wireless, ser uh, wireless service provider fee was a benefit uh, that will increase uh, or decrease expenses on the Setna. And we're also looking at other areas within the Setna that we can apply the same uh, or, or look at and reduce if we can, if there are unneeded expenses. Bill, I just want to make one comment on that. Yeah. That's the office's continued process. Last year we went through all the policies and we made the policy changes, um, which we're still working out 
the remaining few policy changes. And this is now looking at all the rest of the charges that hit the Setna. This will be a continuation that we do every single year from here on out. So we will always be looking at the set note, looking at the rates, looking where they're going up, where they're going down, and monitoring each line item. That, that's, that's correct, Karen. We, we fully anticipate in the future, even though we don't right now, but looking at some of the language that's been put into the uh, proposed legislation is that every year when we, if we make a request to change the set note, that we have to back that up with documentation. So it's not just we want to raise the rate up, but they're going to want to see why we want to do it and uh, what document we have to support that. So we want to start that now and have that in place because we expect to see that happen in the future. Uh, the next item, in 2006, the office issued a letter and was published in regards to um, where can we find that real quick? Automatic rebids uh, for phase two wireless calls. At that time, there was an issue with cellular phones that they were not able to go ahead and do a rebid and keep the audio open at the same time. And the call was dropping during the time of the rebid, so it was making callers think they had lost a 911 call. Also, there's a concern about the database provider's ability to take on a consistent number of requests for rebid information or alley information. Uh, we published, or the office published, a letter uh, saying we did not recommend him doing automatic rebids at that time. Um, with the uh, issue of the phase two wireless information becoming prominent right now, we asked the op or staff looked at the issue. We found out that is no longer the case. The newer technology does not have that issue where it drops the call, nor do the database providers seem about concerned about the number of requests for read informa rebid information from the PSAPs coming in. So we'll be sending out a, a letter rescinding that previous letter from 2006, and that should be coming out in the next within the next month, and we'll post that on our website when it becomes available. Uh, the next item with the office, of course, is the remaining three proposed policy changes. From can I can yes. ask you a question sure. about that before you go further? Mm -hmm. um, has the office reached out to those that are doing the rebidding to see if there are any other effects to the rebidding. Uh, I mean, to understand the carrier's position that, uh, well, if you just rebid, this will solve the problem. But based upon something that stood since June of 2006, CAD systems have been designed in a certain way. What what other things happen if you rebid? I, I don't know that there are, but, I, but I'm hoping that before we unwind this and say that everybody should be, uh, you should try the rebid, are there other implications with certain, uh, certain CAD systems? We expect there are other implications. I don't think it's just to the CAD systems. So we do have um, staff in the 911 office actually looking at the differences of phase one, phase two, and the equipment. And that would also um, include the rebid. So if, if I can suggest to, to ensure, because I'm, I'm sure this is, uh, uh, as it should, it, it's going to draw a lot of attention and a lot of comm centers that have not done rebidding as a regular part of, of their process may start to do it, to include in, in that letter to them uh, the encouragement and the contact to forward information of any other types of impacts as a result of going to a changed uh, process. Uh, again, since uh, we're looking at a seven-year <coughs> seven policy that has said don't rebid. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, not a problem. We'll be glad to add that into the letter. Okay. so. Um, we have the three remaining policy changes still in effect. Uh, the work group is looking at that. Uh, just to remind everybody of the three policy changes, one is to change the replacement cycle from five to seven years. Uh, have PSAPs provide a yearly spending plan by July 1st of each year, and to provide for incremental and system, co and system cost consistent with statute and sunset the annual accrual funding process. That is currently with the work group. Uh, we have staff on that, so we're very anxious to see the final report from the work group on that so we can move forward. Uh, the next item is text to 911. Um, that has begun, become a reality in May 15th of 2014, we hope. 
Uh, we've been meeting with the vendors and PSAPs in regarding the trials we're starting soon. Uh, really trying to get an understanding of what text 911 is at this point in time, uh, what the limitations and what it can actually offer the PSAPs. Uh, just to briefly go back over the trials we'll be conducting, uh, we have one trial up in Butte County we'll be conducting. That is with Entrado and Verizon, and that is an integrated solution, IP base that will actually present the information onto the call taker screen like they would with any other uh, information that's presented. Uh, we have a web browser based application that we'll be testing at CSU Long Beach. That is a TCS and Verizon uh, application. And that is where we're actually using the internet. Uh, requires a separate screen, is not presented on the call taker screen. Uh, we have two applications that are really SMS to TTY. One uses a gateway that allows the different networks to connect in. It's actually converted over at the PSAP, but you'll still, still see it show up as a TTY application at the call taker's position. And that will be at Long Beach PD. And finally, a straight SMS to TTY, which we believe will be the offering in May by most of the carriers. Uh, that will be tested at Downey PD, and that again is a TCS and Verizon application. Uh, after we do the testing, we're hoping to have, or we're planning on having, a final report by June 14 or June of 2014 that outlines the difference between the different type of applications, the benefits of them, uh, and what you can really expect if you do choose to, uh, to uh, accept these applications as a text to 911 for your office. Uh, we'll be starting testing next week. Uh, first testing will be at CSU Long Beach with the web-based application. Uh, things we're really looking at is the ability to, to transfer right now with text. That is an issue. Uh, call location accuracy, it's a little bit different than what we have when you make a voice call because when you do text, it doesn't turn on the GPS like it does in a voice call. Uh, and also where it actually locates the call is different. So those things we'll be definitely looking at. Uh, other concerns right now is language interpretation. We have it for voice. Uh, we interpret 96 languages in California. So with text is a different issue. Um, uh, how it's presented to the call taker, of course, comparison of different methods. Uh, right now, if you have one application, we're using a web-based application versus an IP-based. Can you transfer calls between different applications with different pieces of equipment? So all that's going to be looked at. Uh, those are things we will present in the final report. Uh, the next program we're working on, of course, is the 911 Education Awareness Program. Uh, we've been presenting this over the past few meetings. Just a, a quick uh, re-education. It was to educate the public on proper use of 911 along with the PSAPs, and also, of course, to reduce non-emergency calls made to the PSAPs. Um, we have conducted uh, two surveys recently, a preliminary and a final uh, survey of the PSAPs. It was to look at the trends on how the public uses 911 as seen by the PSAP and also on how the PSAP currently provides 911 education to the public. Uh, we had a 51% participation rate, which was really good out of 455 PSAPs, so we were very happy on that. Uh, we'll be looking at that data uh, to analyze that. It's going to be analyzed by the contractor so we can develop future test pilots with the PSAPs. Uh, we're also in the process of doing a consumer survey. Uh, this is really to take a look at how the citizens view 911 and how they think they should use 911. Um, this survey is in progress. Uh, we're expecting to get the results back in uh, mid-November so we can start doing analysis. We have three remaining uh, pilot projects, uh, those being Mendocino and the Pasadena Ring Project. This is what we call the Evergreen Project. We're essentially renting a service. Uh, from the provider. Uh, these are uh, TCS and AT&T are the uh, companies we're working with. Uh, we're currently working with the providers to uh, validate the GUI or the graphic user interface. This is the screen the call taker takes a look at. Uh, we're expecting to have that uh, completed and operational by first part of 2014, first quarter 2014. The other project that is still outgoing is the Ventura, uh, Ventura project. Uh, that is a hosted solution to allow call takers the ability to move from PSAP to PSAP and replicate the screen uh, from their home PSAP. The first portion of it is in place, the hosted portion is operational. The second half of it is a proof of concept to see if we can get the same ability with XY routing that we were able to, to uh, have very much success with in the Northeast Grant Project uh, with Verizon and have AT&T be able to provide that same uh, uh, ability to us. 
So that is the uh, current status of those projects. The fact sheets for all the pilot projects are posted on our website if you want to get a little more information. Uh, so this really concludes the updates for the 911 office for our, uh, at this point in time. So if you have any questions. I just have one comment. I do want to thank all the PSAPs out there um, that responded to the survey. It was incredible to get that type of response from everyone. We're always told to expect about 30% response and it was incredible so I just want to make sure I thank everyone who did respond yeah and, and, and to add on to Karen's we were kind of bombarding people with uh, surveys at that point in time so the fact that the PSAPs were responsive we do appreciate that uh, Bill I had one question on uh, <coughs> your wireless 911 deployment status um, East Bay Regional Parks has there been contact with them I have talked to them and they consider themselves a secondary PSAP and are not I have not talked to him, no. Yeah. And Wes, have we talked to you, Spain? Okay. Yeah, because they don't. Yeah, they don't feel like they they need to be accepting those calls because they are kind of a secondary piece out behind the the primaries. East Bay Regional Parks. Any other comments, questions? Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Next item is the Long Range Planning Committee. Chris, Aaron. Thank you. Uh, the Long Range Planning Committee met yesterday, uh, as did the 911 Policy Work Group. So just a quick update for the board and the audience on uh, the actions that we took and have been taking. Uh, we did not have uh, a CCTF report yesterday, but I. So the only update on new and impacting technologies that we have for you is the uh, Chrysler's Uconnect. I'm sure everyone saw there's been uh, memos that came out from APCO and NINA providing information to educate the PSAP, so we would encourage all PSAPs that haven't seen that to seek that out. I, I don't know, is that, on the, is that on the State 901 website? Anyone? If not, it would probably be worthwhile to get the Chrysler Uconnect information. Uh, on the website as well. We'll do that. Thanks. Well, we're continuing with the Warren Act review, um, and where we're at on that is we've gone through, and we have a first draft done that's really just updating language, and then we've also tasked a couple of members with gathering information from other states uh, to see what other 911 funding methods are, are out there. So continue to work on that. Uh, the next Gen 911 presentation is being updated by the State 911 office, and that will be provided to the LRPC members to use in um, their outreach. Uh, the State 911 office is also working on the operations manual, a glossary, uh, getting that to me so we can get a final draft for you. We did review uh, at the last advisory board meeting, it was asked that the LRPC look into the county coordinator uh, reimbursements. So we did, we did a review uh, yesterday, and there's actually a document in your packet, and that's what we looked at. It has the reimbursements by county for the last two fiscal years. Uh, we found that information to be useful and asked that it be provided on an annual basis to the LRPC and the advisory board. you find that in your packet, and if you have questions, I'm sure the office can answer those. And we, we had a brief discussion, but also have asked that uh, the county coordinators be put on uh, our future agenda, as well as that the CCTF um, work with us on this so that we can have further discussion on whether it may be beneficial to set some standards or expectations for county coordinators. Uh, during the discussion, it was, I think we determined that those may, may not exist or do not exist, really, and so there may be um, county coordinators out there who, who don't know what the expectations are. And in addition, I think uh, some members indicated that it may be beneficial to have some recurring county coordinator training, for, for new county coordinators, that is. And we briefly spoke about perhaps Calnina, the Calnina Mission Critical Training being a, a good venue for that. So uh, that's essentially the report on the county coordinators. On the 911 Policy Work Group, uh, uh, as you know, Chuck and I are on that. Chuck is the chair of that uh, work group. We've had... Um, we also had a survey, as it was mentioned, a couple surveys. Uh, we had 80% response, according to Monica, yesterday. So, And that really is attributed to the hard work of the office, as well as the members on the work group. Uh, several people 
took the list provided by the office and you know made phone calls. So 80% response. I I I was very surprised. At, That's at almost how, unheard of. Right. So out of 455 PSAPs. So one of the main things that the work group did was reviewed those responses. Uh, had had some discussion on those items. We did finalize our draft incremental and residual equipment list. Uh, we also discussed and agreed on a uh, spending plan, the annual spending plan. We have a recommendation for that. Chuck's drafting that document. Uh, we don't have either of those documents to share with the board. You know that'll all be part of the uh, final report. But just wanted to give you an update on where we were on those items. Our next meeting is uh, a December fourth conference call. And again, just thanks to the office. You know you mentioned making sure the office was at the LRPC and the work group meetings. And we had great support from uh, Monica, Bill, uh, Dana, and then the consultants have all been available, especially when we're all there in person. It, it's, I think it's been really beneficial. Uh, Chuck, anything else to add or anything I missed? Not to put you on the spot. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. No, I don't think so. Once again, you know, thanks to the, the office for their help. They've been, Monica especially, has been extremely helpful in providing information as we need it. Because we're in the, we are in the information gathering phase of this, so it's it's been extremely important to have that support. And then the final thing today, um, also mentioned at our last uh, advisory board meeting, was that we finally have the LRPC charter, and we have the final draft. It is in your packet, and we do need a, a motion for approval on that today. If there aren't any questions. And this, has, this document has been before the board before, and I think that was discussed and there was some feedback, and so this is the final draft put together by the office and the LRPC. So has everybody had a chance to look at this, and are we ready to have a motion to approve? Those of us on the LRPC are. <laughs> yeah, I think. So this is Chuck Burdan. I make a motion that we approve the uh, Long Range Planning Committee Charter. Is there a second? Charlie Cullen seconds. Is there any discussion before a vote? And I'll just comment. I think the main discussion that we had last time was under organization. So if we want to, we can take a moment just to make sure everyone takes a look at that. Because that's where some changes were made in, in terms of the makeup and who could be and how many people could be on the LRPC. So the total six members maximum, and only five, can't be named more than five from this board? Correct. Correct. How many members are there now? There are five of us. Uh, Michelle, uh, Charlie, Chuck, myself, and Chief Charman. So we are we do not have a representative from the police chiefs. That's next. Mm -hmm. That's new business. All right. Oh, I'm jumping ahead. Well, see if we approve this, then that will just making sure segue perfectly for you. Because I see that's actually itemized down here as well. Gotcha. That's the recommendation. So are we ready for a vote or more comments, questions? Karen, I'm going to suggest to you just for uh, for flexibility purposes, since you're going to make this a charter, and rather than having to agendize revisions of charter, not being able to foresee what's ahead of us, uh, if there is a way to add to the uh, to the organization section uh, that additional members of the board may be added based upon uh, a need presented and subject to the approval of the committee, so that. Uh, so that we don't have to go back and amend a charter for the purposes of some sort of business that comes up. We have something come before us, and and it's deemed that uh, you need a a broader scope of people working with LRPC on it. It, it may be a two three month project, or it may be longer, but uh, that way there's flexibility in it. Uh, I, I'm even fine with it being at the at the. Uh, at the chair's level for approval based upon something so you don't have to wait for a, uh, a meeting. But some sort of language that gives you flexibility to this based on circumstances that come up. I, I just think it's a good business practice. So what is the LRP see? I, I think that'd be fine. We can 
support that. Do you have the language, or do, do we need Sam to repeat, repeat what he wants to add? Yeah, because we'll need, we'll need a motion to right. um, vote on this with the suggested so, language. And I don't know that we need to have it word for word, but if we can get the, the gist of what we need to do. Do you have a motion on the floor already? We do have a motion and a second. We can amend okay. that. I'll recommend an amendment and see if I can get concurrence on the first and second. I recommend you amend uh, as presented and add that at the direction of the uh, chair of the committee, additional members may be appointed uh, for specific work as needed. If that's acceptable language, do we have a motion to approve the charter with the amended language? Would that be... Um would it be that at the discretion of the chair to appoint additional members to uh, working committees to work on specific issues, similar to what we're doing now? But with the, uh, no, I'm, I'm saying specifically to LRPC. To, to the actual LRPC. So you, you could appoint uh, subject matter experts to address particular issues? Or, or you just need additional bodies, because the way things are going right now, it seems every time we turn around at every meeting, LRPC gets piled and piled and piled. and. There's, there's only so much bandwidth, so um, having the ability to add, to add additional people, I, I think, is, you know, is to the benefit of, of, of the committee here and certainly to LRPC. Just the direction from the office in the past has been we have to you know, make sure that we don't have more than five members of the advisory board. Correct, or else we so have a meeting similar to this, correct. yes. Correct, so we obviously um, just have to keep that in mind, but... But I think it's fine to add that. Well, the, uh, so, Madam Chair, the, what, what we have is we have a, a, an amendment mm -hmm. proposed. Mm -hmm. So we need to go back to the motion, uh, whoever made the motion, and the second, and see if they'll accept the amendment. Chuck, I think you made the motion. Uh, all the move as move as amended. And uh, the second concurs. Okay. Now we can call for the question. Yeah. Now, are there any other questions? Okay, we'd like to vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. And that was the end of your presentation? That's the end of my report. Your report, okay. Um, County Coordinator Task Force? Well, we want to be able to make sure the okay. folks listening in on the web. Okay. And this is Wes Nita, not Nancy Vaughn. <laughs> the CCTF has really nothing to report today, and they would um, like to request due to travel restrictions that they are only on the agenda when they have something new to report. And so I don't know how the board feels about that, but I don't know because they're on the agenda, and they didn't, and they they felt like if they don't have anything new to report with all the, the travel challenges that face them, that if it's okay with the board, they wouldn't uh, be on the agenda every meeting. Is that something that is possible? My recommendation would be that we keep them on the agenda as we have them now, and if there's nothing to report, having you come up and say there's nothing to report because you are part of that committee would suffice. Okay. I agree. Or if they could, they could submit a written report yes. through Wes. I think that would be fine as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So nothing to report for the county coordinator task force. Now we'll move on to new business. Um, Long Range Planning Committee member nominee Michael Langston. So we'd like to add um, a police chief. Uh, thanks, Your Honor. Actually, it's not a police chief. Okay. It's uh, just a, a representative, a representative? Uh, representing okay. the California police chiefs. It's uh, Cheryl Lesage, she's a communications manager of Fremont Police Department. She's a long-term practitioner, 911 practitioner, and uh, involved in the regional 911 issues, and um, we believe she'll be a good fit with the Long Range Planning Committee. I'd like to make that uh, nomination. Okay, and do we have a second? Second. Is there any comments or questions? Okay, like to vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. I would just ask that uh, her contact information be passed along to the chair of the LRPC uh, forthwith so we can get her, busy, get her in huh? the mix. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do that. 
Thank you. Okay, agenda items for future meetings. Um, we will be having the ISO from the Department of Technology scheduled. Um, my, my hope is to have her scheduled at the next meeting. We will have um, the California Public Utilities Commission, Ryan Doolin, our former Deputy Director for 911. Um, I talked to him, and that will probably be on our second meeting in 2014. And then we will have our presentations on Next Gen 911. Um, I'm looking that will I would like that to be at our first meeting in 2014. And then we do need to revisit the Next Gen 911 roadmap and provide a presentation because we've made a lot of progress on the roadmap and some of the things have changed. So that will be on our future agenda as well. Is there anything anyone would like to add? Um, one of the things I wanted just to mention, although I don't want to add it at this time, is once we get our California First Responders Network Board of Directors up and going, um, we could have them, you know, mid-year or so, 2014, come up and be able to report out on how we're doing with FirstNet to keep the advisory board um, in the loop with FirstNet. We do. We have a couple of representatives. Okay, and are there any announcements at this time? Okay, with no announcements, we'll move on to public comment. And I believe we did have one public comment on training. <laughs> and if you could state your name and then provide the comment. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, good morning. Danita Crombeck, Ventura County Sheriff's Office, also president of the California chapter of the National Emergency Number Association. Um, on a couple of points, uh, Chief Spiegel, I think I understand your concern in wanting to ensure that when people are being, or agencies are being reimbursed for people attending a conference, that they're actually attending the training. Um, and, and we share that concern. Um, I would ask for consideration that it be part of the state's reimbursement request that um, the ownership or the responsibility for that be placed on the individual with a statement something along the lines of I you know my signature below confirms that I attended the breakout sessions during the conference my concern is that president of the county in a chapter is that for us to assume responsibility for uh, some type of a checks and balances and check you know checking people in at every breakout session we don't have the staff for that and if we try to do it electronically that's an added expense that we don't have the funding for so we want to make sure that people are attending the training and we want to make sure that those that are receiving reimbursement are only receiving the reimbursement when they've actually attended the classes. But I'd also like to see if there's a way to do that without adding a burden that could actually be a financial burden on a volunteer not-for-profit organization. Okay, thank you very much. And we will absolutely take that into consideration. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Okay, with no further public comments, we will move to the closed session. So we will ask, um, pursuant to government code section 11126.18c um, of the detailed information on outages, do I have a motion for to move toward the closed session? Motion to go to closed session. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we will now move toward the closed session. I'd like to ask the public to leave the room for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. Um, after the closed session, we will immediately call everybody back and adjourn the meeting. Thank you.
Okay, the closed session has now completed, so we are going to adjourn the meeting. The next meetings will take place. Now I lost my letter. Oh, I found it. Okay, the next meetings will be Wednesday, February 19, 2014. Wednesday, May 21, 2014. Wednesday, August 20, 2014 and Wednesday, November 19, 2014. So we will post those on our website. And with that, I adjourn the meeting. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, was Jeff Johnson helpful for you guys? Very good. Yeah. Okay.